Good afternoon. My name is Amar Jyot Singh, and I'm here to talk to a lawyer from Calgary who specializes in misrepresentation cases. What is misrepresentation, and how does it affect your file if you are trying to put up a file? Or perhaps you're already facing a misrep. So we will talk about those issues, and we will also talk to the lawyer about a case that he recently handled, and he won in the federal court. Uh, his name is Michael Green, and he's with me from Calgary. Mr. Green, how are you? Hi, I'm Ajot. I'm great. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking time. I know we had to schedule this interview a couple of times, but I'm quite uh, glad that you could join in. Um, I read cases uh, for a living, for a profession, as a passion. I, I love to dig into Canly and look up those cases depending on what topics I want to read. For example, misrepresentation. So I read a lot of misrep cases and one of the cases that caught my attention was the cases that we will talk today. And let me just show you on the screen for people who, who are interested to follow this up. And you will see the, uh, you see the federal court uh, insignia on the top and the docket number, citation number, the name of the client. And if you are interested, uh, you can, uh, copy and paste this name and put this in Google or go to federal court website and search this on your own. So this is the case that we will start a discussion with. And uh, we, will, we will ask the lawyer to tell us a little background of the case. What really happened? How did the client come to you? And what was your initial strategy? So I got this case after the client had already uh, received a, a refusal um, from the, uh, pr sorry, a procedural fairness letter, it is indicating the application could be refused for misrepresentation. So he had made his own application using an immigration consultant. Um, and in, in making his application for a work permit, uh, he had submitted uh, IELTS results, language test results uh, with, with the application to show that he could speak uh, modest, uh, a modest amount of English. Uh, the, the petition was uh, for a cleaning supervisor. Um, so he submitted the application and then it came back with this letter saying that we believe your IELTS results uh, are fraudulent uh, and you've got 30 days to explain. He sent his own explanation in, this is before I was involved, he sent in an explanation that said that he had taken the test from what he thought was a reputable language center. He'd taken a, a, a course from them and then at the end they did the test and then he got sent the results. He had no reason to believe they weren't uh, genuine. The next thing you know, he gets a refusal letter uh, that says uh, you're uh, inadmissible to Canada for five years for misrepresentation because you submitted fraudulent test results. So at that point we came in, uh, we filed in federal court. I, I, I was retained to do that. We filed in federal court to challenge the, the decision. Um, and then we had to wait to get the, the officer's computer notes because you can't tell anything uh, from the form letters they sent you, uh, that they send you in these cases. So it was when the computer results, uh, the, the notes came back, that we realized what was the basis for uh, their finding. And what they said was that um, they had done a QA, and that's, that's all they said, a QA. Following a QA, it was discovered that the IELTS results were fraudulent. They didn't explain what was fraudulent. They didn't explain anything about it. They just said it's fraudulent. And, sa and saying that his explanation when he was responding to the procedural fairness letter explanation, uh, they, they clearly misunderstood some things, but say he didn't deny that it was fraudulent um, and, or explain why he submitted fraudulent. Uh, results and th both things just weren't weren't true. So there are some problems with it. So off to federal court we went. Did you did you just say that the applicant did not deny that this was a fraudulent certificate? No, that's what the uh, officer said in the officer's reasons. The applicant, in fact, did deny. He says I had no reason to believe they were not genuine. I thought they were genuine, and so um, the officer clearly misunderstood what he was saying. So there was. There were, in this case, a number of errors by, that the court found that the officer made errors. That's one of them, that to, to say that he didn't deny when, in fact, he did deny. He did say he thought they were genuine. Um, they, and also, the, the biggest, I think, biggest flaw with the whole decision was uh, that uh, they didn't give any particulars of what, what, the, what the alleged fraud was for the, for the applicant to be able to respond. 
uh, because it's, it, the, the whole idea of a procedural fairness letter is if they think there's a problem with your application that you might be inadmissible, they're supposed to give you a chance to explain. Well, they, if they don't tell you what's the problem, how can you explain? In this case, they said following a QA, and we don't know what a QA is. We can assume that it might mean quality assessment uh, but, or quality assurance, but we don't know. And the judge said, I don't know. I can't tell from this. I don't know what they did, whether there was any really real basis for the finding. So that's not fair. That's not giving a truly, a true procedural fairness, a chance to respond uh, to the allegations. Looks like, looks like this was a matter of uh, uh, a weak uh, PFL, a procedure fairness letter, uh, the reasoning that, uh, that nailed the deal. Uh, if, they, if the visa officer would have explained uh, more clearly that they did a quality assurance check or quality assessment check through an online. I think I think I read the case what uh, what uh, later on the minister's council said that perhaps they did an online check of the certificate itself by you know you can copy and paste the the number of the certificate on an online uh, you know verification system and by which if they if it is genuine it shows genuine if it's not it does not show. Uh, if if the visa officer would have told them specifically that uh, the your numbers don't match up, uh, I guess the client uh, would would had uh, you know been uh, you know absolutely nothing to say in the in the defense. Um, yeah, that's right. If you'd known what it was, like you know what we don't know and what we said in our pleadings in our argument was we can't tell if they're suggesting that the um, the test was never written that the, the whole document was forged or that somebody else wrote the test using, uh, you know, pretending to be our client or the scores were changed. Uh, we don't know any of those things. Uh, and so there's no way for him to respond. But if they had given him that, that information and said, for instance, there never was a test with this number or there was a, you know, the scores have been changed or something, then uh, they would have had uh, an opportunity to respond and it might've been impossible to respond. It depends what, what the nature of the uh, of the allegation is now. What's going to happen is we're going to find out because the um, in, in refusing or in granting our application uh, and overturning the officer's decision, the matter will go back to a visa office, a different visa officer, yeah. uh, for determination. Yeah. And so I expect we will get another procedural fairness letter uh, this time with uh, with more details. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. I mean, uh, what is what is the uh, I mean uh, the, uh, the 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 timing of the refusal? Did the visa officer actually wait before the PFL response was received, or did he had already decided before the applicant provided his response to the PFL in thirty days? Right, good question. Because uh, in fact, that was another flaw in the officer's decision, and there was this really quite a flawed decision, and I was actually surprised that the Department of Justice didn't consent on this one because they often do when they, they discover they don't have a winnable case. Um, but in this case, the officer went and, and, and uh, this, this uh, occurred in a review that happened after the work permit had already been issued. Um, the, the work permit was issued and then um, somebody decided to do, uh, who knows, the file might have been audited uh, it may have been uh, personal feelings of the officer because he had previously refused a work permit for the same individual and he resubmitted it in a, a different office in Amman, Jordan um, and got the work permit there. And then it was the original office in Ankara that did this review. And so who knows why it happened, but he, what the officer said is, here's your procedural fairness letter, you've got 30 days to respond and I've canceled your work permit and your visa. <laughs> yeah. So in, in a, in effect, the officer made his decision before he had heard a response to the procedural fairness letter. Yeah. And so it was wrong on so many, so many counts here. Um, but so that we were able to argue the officer prejudged the case. You know, yeah. that's, not, that's not procedural fairness if they've already made a decision. Uh, seems, like, uh, seems like the officer hurt, uh, hurt his case himself, actually. Uh, and of course, uh, now, the bin, now you have the reversal. So uh, the, the application has gone back to the visa officer, are you aware, or still there's a time lag uh, for, for them to reach determination, like, you know? It's back to the visa office. Uh, we don't know. What we have found uh, is that there's often quite a big time lag 
between when you get a, a, a successful federal court case and uh, when the it next gets uh, actioned by the visa office. And I don't know if that's just a prioritization, uh, if, it's, if, if it's deliberate that they almost punish you for challenging them. It sometimes feels like it. It, 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 it actually feels like it sometimes because it can be so many months before you actually get to hear uh, what's going to what's going to happen uh, next on your case. Yeah. Um, but yeah. at least we get another crack at it and uh, there's an opportunity, especially if we can find out what is the alleged misrepresentation or fraudulent uh, nature of that, that document. Uh, it's, it's challenging because the, the language school he took this from doesn't exist anymore. So he could not find, uh, you know, the people responsible to, to get an explanation. So it could be, that whole thing could be challenging. That sounds bizarre that the person, that the people who can, who arranged to conduct the test and maybe who were responsible for getting this, this results, uh, you know, transmitted to the applicant, they themselves are out of business. Uh, it is not unlikely that everything was a sham to begin with anyway, but that is beyond the jurisdiction of our, our uh, scope of matter now. I'm showing on the screen, uh, you can, you are able to see my screen, right? I'm showing uh, section 41. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is this is immigration refugee protection act for people uh, who are who are not very familiar with immigration law uh, I'm, I'm showing this on the screen this is on the justice uh, website uh, it's right here uh, guys you can if you want, want you you can go there and directly see this uh, can you just briefly tell people uh, in in a short summary uh, and give some examples of misrepresentation that people do not understand the seriousness of this breach and how, how is it deadly? I know people understand this for five years, but what else can go wrong in, in, uh, uh, in inadvertent mistakes, especially, uh, and how, how, how they can avoid uh, getting, you know, getting to do these mistakes in the application form? Yeah, sure. And the, um, it, it, it's so important uh, because it, it uh, used to be a rare thing that we would find allegations of misrepresentation and now they seem to be very, very common, and, and the department is using them all the time uh, to um, uh, to refuse applications. And the, the the test is 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 pretty weak. So if you put that up on the screen again, yes, yes I'll, I'll just yes. yeah. want to refer you to the absolutely um, just absolutely. one sentence in there. Um, I've been practicing now for almost forty years. Uh, the old Immigration Act before 2002 uh, did have a misrepresentation provision in it, but the only consequence of misrepresentation was your application would be refused. You could then turn around and apply again. Yeah. Uh, so when uh, IRPA came in, the Immigration Refugee Protection Act and came in on July 1st, 2002, it, con it contained this provision here, section 40, and it's 41A that you're, you're gonna be most interested in. Um, person is inadmissible for misrepresentation for directly or indirectly misrepresenting or withholding material facts relating to a relevant matter that induces or could induce an error in the administration of this act. So um, the, uh, there's all kinds of ways you can commit misrepresentation uh, or you can be found guilty of misrepresentation. I'm gonna talk about uh, some of those for you. Uh, but this, what you have to understand is, is, is the penalty that comes from this. So when they brought this this provision in, they said the penalty would be, you'd be uh, two years inadmissible to Canada. Um, so you couldn't apply to come back, you couldn't get into Canada um, for two years, and then after that, the slate is clean and you could apply again. Um, when the Harper government was in power in, uh, I think it's about 2015, if I'm not mistaken, it was 13 or 15, uh, they brought in, uh, significant changes to very many aspects of the uh, IRPA, but one of them uh, was to increase the penalty from two years to five years. Yeah. So now if you're found uh, inadmissible for misrepresentation, you are barred from coming to Canada for five years. Um, and so, uh, and that can affect your family members too. So your spouse can't get permanent residence status if you're inadmissible uh, for five years. And so for a lot of people, it destroys their dream of coming to Canada. Um, they, uh, it can, it just completely messes it up. Uh, if it results in deportation, it's even worse. Then they could, uh, they have to get special permission to come back, um, which is very hard, hard to obtain. 
Um, the, what's interesting about the wording, I want to talk about different kinds of misrepresentation. And this is where people need to be really careful uh, because it can happen without your knowledge and where you're not intending to lie and you're completely innocent. And, and that usually happens when a third party, uh, such as an agent, uh, uh, your uh, a consultant or a lawyer, um, fills out the forms uh, or provides information that isn't correct. Um, and it goes in with the application. Um, you're not even aware of it maybe, but you can be inadmissible to Canada just because wrong information was submitted. Uh, so an example is uh, I had a case where the fellows, he hired a, an unauthorized consultant in, uh, in his home country uh, who claimed he was actually authorized, uh, but he wasn't. Um, and uh, this guy submitted uh, a false bank statement. Um, he, uh, to, to indicate my client had funds uh, to, to qualify under the federal skilled worker program. Well, he did, my client didn't know that that's what had been done. He thought that it was all legitimate, that nothing, he, he didn't see that before it went in. He had signed the forms, the application went in, he later finds out that, that the bank statement was fraudulent. Um, and apparently this is something that that consultant was doing on a regular basis. Did they find out after the visa application was submitted or notified by the visa officer or did they uh, find out even before the submission and so they had a chance to rectify the, uh, the error? No. If he had found out beforehand, he would have rectified it. My, my, my client was a physician. He had funds. But he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't have a bank statement, and, and unfortunately, uh, they they manufactured a bank statement for him, and he he, had, he hadn't realized, and so he just trusted these people, and of course they got caught because the the immigration checked with the bank, the bank said uh, no, that's uh, that's not real, that's not a that's not one of our accounts, and. Um, so the, the poor fellow uh, explained that this was a, a, a mistake made by uh, an unauthorized consultant that had duped him. And the, the visa office didn't care. They, they still refused the application. And they're really in that case, because we couldn't see a breach of procedural fairness, there wasn't a ground for really challenging the decision in federal court. And people have to know that there's a, a, been a lot of federal court decisions where the court has found that even though the applicant didn't know that there was a lie in the application or the applicant might have misunderstood a question, um, it's, it's no defense. Now, another example, this is probably the most common one I'm seeing a lot of lately, is where there's a question on the uh, application form for various kinds of uh, temporary and permanent uh, applications uh, for status in Canada, or TRV applications, that's temporary resident visa for work permits, visitors, study permits for permanent residents. There's a question, have you ever been refused uh, or, or uh, refused a visa or ordered to leave Canada or any other country? And it's that wording of that question that's a killer. Um, so many people stop at the word Canada and don't understand the words or any other country. Now sometimes that's because of the way it's been explained to them by whoever's helping with the application. Sometimes uh, is just their own misunderstanding. Um, in, uh, in one case I have, it was on the website of the Mexican embassy, the, the Spanish translation stopped at the word Canada, didn't say or any other country. And so we have something to fight there because we have a, screen, a screenshot of that one. But um, lots of times it's just people, poor English, they're, they're relying on a third party to translate um, and they don't understand the question. And they forget to, uh, to or they don't, uh, disclose that they were refused a visa, say, to the United States, which is the most common one. Well, our, our visa officers obviously have a direct pipeline to the U.S. database because this comes up all the time where the, um, yeah, there, there's, there's the question in, in there's, 2B there's a on that. I, I just want to do, I just wanted to quickly add to your uh, wording off that you said that have you ever been refused a visa or permit uh, I, you know, if, till, till the visa permit, yes, people can understand. Have you been refused a permit to leave Canada or any country? But I, I wanted to show you something else that I think many people who, who are world travelers, they have experience with immigration systems all over the world. 
and they still cannot understand the meaning of this. Uh, denied entry. So, so somebody, somebody may have, somebody may have never been refused for U.S., Australia, New Zealand, the Five Eyes. You know, never been refused. They have wonderful travel history, but poor chance. Maybe they went to Cyprus or they went to some other country. I'm just, I'm just taking the name of Cyprus, not to uh, mention Cyprus. But if they were denied entry from the airport itself, so that means. For some reason, the port entry, they say, sorry, you don't have money or something you, for vacation, you go back. That also has to be mentioned here. And, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think many people understand the, the clear, the inference of this word denied entry. So refuse your visa, denied entry, or leave Canada, any other country or territory. This is the most confusing word, uh, words, uh, collection of words in immigration system that I would say 50% of the people will get it wrong at the first outset. Well, uh, you know, we see it all the time coming up in, in, uh, um, in our applications because we do lots of applications of every kind in our office. And this question is, is you're right, it's often misunderstood. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, we often, you know, if you're not careful as, as, a, as a lawyer like myself, if you're not careful, you can get caught on this one. Um, you've got to make sure the client understands the question. And so sometimes what we do is we'll send the blank forms to the client, ask them to fill them out. They send them back and we trust that they're giving us the proper answers. Well, it doesn't work if they don't understand the question. And that is a very confusing question. I think, um, I think that they need to break that question into, you know, more than one question. Um, and so that it's, it's, it's crystal clear and they, they should separate other countries from Canada. Um, or else they should just say refused entry to any or denied a visa to any country and leave out the words Canada. They don't, they don't add anything to that question. Uh, but in any event, people do, that, that's right, they don't always understand because, for instance, if you show up at a land crossing, let's say at the Alberta-Montana border, um, and an officer says, nah, I don't think you're a genuine visitor, I, I'm not going to let you in today, or you, you don't have the right pieces of paper. Um, you know, you, you, you want this work permit, but you haven't shown me that you've got the qualifications uh, that are necessary. So come back when you do. Well, that's a denial of entry. Yeah, it is. And uh, they often, what they'll do is they issue something called an ATL, which is allowed to leave. Yeah. And that happens quite frequently. It means that you don't get an actual order to leave Canada. You're allowed to withdraw your application. And that's what you're doing. You're withdrawing your application to enter Canada. Well, is that a refusal or not? Uh, or a denial of entry? I, t I say it is. Um, so we, I always tell my clients that you've got to answer yes to that question. There is some uh, debate because if you're withdrawing your application, it's your decision to withdraw. And so you could, you could say, I wasn't re you know, refused entry. I was told I didn't have the right uh, papers to qualify and so I was allowed to withdraw my application uh, so you know it's, it's one of those could have a yes or no answer but it's dangerous to answer no and then have it come up in the system uh, that you actually were refused entry because that's what the computer notes show and you said no to the, the, the question and now that's misrepresentation and you're in big trouble let me add a little twist uh, to this situation let us assume, and this is a scenario to you, let us assume that uh, the applicant said, yes, I was, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, no, I was never denied entry from the US border. But in his application package, he has uh, uh, enclosed all the pages of his passport and perhaps there's a stamp by US CBP showing that, that he left on certain date. So in, in other words, the, the form is incorrectly filled, but there are some indications elsewhere in the application package to show that uh, to show that he, something did happen at the border, so that it's visible to the processing staff. What do you think? So uh, we were successful on on a misrep case, which was something like that. On the forms, the guy had put on his uh, personal history, which shows his, where he worked, where he lived, that kind of thing. Um, that he had been living in Iran throughout the, this uh, a period of time. Um, but in fact, he had spent a year on secondment in Paris, working in Paris. 
And that wasn't disclosed on the Schedule A, which is the form that lists those, those things. Yeah. However, on the travel history form that was attached, it was disclosed where that he had been in Paris for this period of time. And so they alleged misrepresentation. Uh, we explained that this was a case where um, the guy had given the draft forms written in Farsi to his consultant. The consultant had made the mistake of when he typed up the forms, didn't include that period of time in Paris. Now what mistake or what, I don't know why he, was, why he did it that way, but that's what he did. Our guy had signed blank forms, so he never saw the error. <laughs> Um, so I he that, was. I, I love that signing blank forms. <laughs> exactly, and that's so. That was his bad. That was his mistake. And you should never ever sign blank forms because you don't know what's there, and you are held responsible. But in this particular case, uh, Department of Justice actually consented uh, on this application because uh, we, you know, we were able to show that there was, you know, it was clearly the error of the consultant, but that the Canadian officer was not misled the information was there readily in the package that uh, you know he had been in Paris for that period of time and so you know they, they overturned the refusal in that case reopened the case up again but there are some lessons there is just you know you have to be so careful yes. with who you hire yes. for a representative um, that they are a trustworthy person and that they're competent because there's a lot of these places where you know, you have, it's, it's like a mill that, that they're just churning out applications and <laughs> I like that. Yeah. They've got, maybe, they, yeah, they've it's got a, a license a mill. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they, they'll have a licensed lawyer or licensed consultant who is the name on the, on the letterhead, but that person's not really involved in the application. It's being prepared by somebody who doesn't have the professional training uh, and, and the same level of accountability. And, and, and especially if they're trying to do high volume, low cost, um, they, they, they may be at, at best careless and, and at a, a worst, they will actually distort the facts to try to increase their chances of success. And um, what people have to understand is that you can't blame it on a third party. You're going to be held responsible, even if, if you happen to make the bad judgment to hire a liar for a consultant, not a lawyer, but a liar or, or a, you know, a fraud artist or somebody who was just completely incompetent. That's, uh, you know, it's, or, or just somebody who made a mistake. Um, you're responsible. So uh, people have to be really, really careful. I think it's really important to hire somebody with a really good reputation um, and uh, stay away from people who have a reputation for uh, not always telling the truth. And in particular, if, if a consultant or a lawyer ever suggests that you say something that isn't 100% accurate, run away, hire somebody else, fire that person right away, because yeah. it, can ruin, it can ruin your life, and we see it on a regular basis, people's lives ruined uh, by unscrupulous representatives. Mike, uh, I can tell you from my personal uh, experience of talking to hundreds of people every month, because I get calls and people look at this YouTube channel of different videos about uh, just like this topic and other topics. Uh, I, I can safely tell you that they are close to uh, 4,000 plus registered consultants in Canada who are uh, licensed to do immigration representations to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the CIC. Uh, I do not know how many lawyers, total strength of lawyers or the members of law society all over Canada, but I can tell uh, everybody that not everybody uh, is specialized in immigration law, even though it looks like a harmless uh, piece of you know, a, a line of business besides doing bankruptcy and contract and other things. But many lawyers themselves uh, tend to make mistakes about these small errors. I, I don't want to take names, but I got a call uh, recently last, uh, uh, last about 10 days. Uh, there was a lawyer in uh, Toronto area who advised the client to hide their unlawful stay in Europe. Uh, this person who had spent some illegal uh, presence in, in Europe. And then later on, they, uh, you know, they had the arranged marriage with somebody, a sponsor in, in Canada. And uh, if they had disclosed their illegal stay, well, that was close to about three years plus uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, then they would also have to produce a police clearance certificate so that this lawyer uh, 
do you say liar lawyer? Uh, he counseled the person to ignore uh, and, and let that background, you know, you know, sink away. Don't let that show because otherwise you will be demanded a police clearance certificate and, you know, and possibly he had some crime issue there, which I don't know. But, uh, you know, this is what the counsel, but eventually the IRCC found out and they were issued a misrep letter. So yeah. it is. It is not only. It is not only just consultants, but anybody can make a mistake. I always tell people. I always tell clients to go to any lawyer of their choice. Spend at least an hour or two hours with them. Pay their consultation fees and learn about these provisions first before you decide to hire anybody. So, for example, if they had a, like a half an hour. Uh, instruction lesson on misrepresentation and the requirements of the spousal sponsorship, at least they will be in a better position to decide whether this this line of application is the right one for them, or maybe they should have tried some other way like express entry work permit or something else. Uh, so they they need to understand what are they facing with and then understand who is the right, right professional to uh, coach them through. Yeah, that's why I say reputation is so important. Yeah. Um, and it's not always easy because some, uh, you know, often when I, I get people come to me who uh, they've used somebody who I know has a terrible reputation. I say, why did you go to that person? Well, so my friend had used them and they, everything went fine. So, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, we see these, there's some people who I've seen, uh, they just have that reputation for not telling the truth uh, when, when they're doing applications. And, and so, you know, that's... Uh, it's just really unfortunate, um, but there are people who just, maybe their nature is to do that. Maybe they don't have a, an ethical compass. I mean, lawyers can be disbarred for it, and they have been, or they've been suspended. And um, I, uh, I'm always disappointed if I see somebody gets off the hook by the Law Society for, for counseling somebody to lie, because I think it's a really serious offense. And uh, it, it's, it's maddening to see and that we're hoping that they're going to clean up that the new consultants regime will be much more uh, effective at their disciplinary process. But in the past, they never really acted against, uh, there's so many people who were repeatedly, uh, you know, telling people to lie on their applications or they're just inventing stories for them for refugee cases or for applications and never getting consequences. But hopefully that, hopefully that will change. Um, unfortunately, hopefully the, the, the standards will be much higher to become a consultant, so we'll see less of that prob problem. But there's also the problem with agents who are not, they're not licensed consultants, and they're usually operating in the home countries. Like, I know in India, there's a lot of them, um, and they don't sign the application forms because they're not allowed to, yeah. but they'll prepare the forms, and people rely on them, and, and quite often those things have lies in them, and um, to which are intended to improve somebody's chances, but, but uh, actually can be result in, in, in permanent uh, problems for that person. Let me, let me point, out, uh, point out to uh, one of the most interesting questions that I, I bet many people who are watching this conversation, they would like to ask you, uh, and they are asking so many people, but, but the response to them is, is, is not consistent. And I will start this question by a look at the section on the screen 41b so you've got the you've got so, the decision up on the screen right now oh, it's not it's a, the oh, oh it's a decision okay let me see if i can uh, I'll do it again uh my mistake uh here you go sorry yeah take a look at the section 41b yeah for being or having been sponsored by a person who's determined to be inadmissible for misrep. So let's take a case. Uh, uh, somebody applies for a study visa from overseas and uh, he has a wife and he has dependent children. And now for some reason, whatever reason, he has been declared inadmissible because of misrep and it has been determined. Uh, they, they, the minister have made a report and uh, they are. What happens to the spouse? Is the spouse inadmissible as well? Yeah. So let's keep in mind. Remember that this is a uh, he, that person's here on a temporary status, so no, they no. become inadmissible. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry, they, sorry, they, sorry. So they're they're not here. Nobody's here. The whole family. The whole family is overseas. The husband tried to come here on a on a 
study visa. The study visa was declined and the husband has been charged for misrep for producing wrong bank statement or ILTS certificate or something. So now the husband has been under the five year bar. Now the wife independently wants to travel, intends to travel to Canada just to meet somebody. Is the wife also now being inadmissible because the husband is? Right. Um, okay. I'm so looking at section 41B. Yeah, and you're also going to see the answer to that question in a later section. I think it's in section 41 or 42. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I, I know you were going there, so I'm, I'm ready for that. And here it is. Uh, yeah, 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 it is. It is right here, 42. Uh, uh, 42 one exceptions are right here. This is the exceptions you see on the screen. Right. So, so then there, uh, it just depends what it is. Uh, they're, they're, they, they loosen it up um, so that inadmissibility doesn't affect the, the temporary ad, uh, admissibility of family members, except in the cases of certain types of, of uh, Inadmissibility, which 30, is 34, 34, 35, 35, 35, 37, which is serious crime or human right violation or one of those. Uh, it's yeah, not serious crime, actually, it's organized crime. Organized crime, uh, organized crime. Yeah, yeah. Or, or security. Yeah. Um, so, so those ones are the only ones that make you make the spouse inadmissible for temporary purposes. But for permanent residents, yeah, she can't get her permanent residence. Absolutely. So she'll be. You, at, you will be. Purpose. You will be surprised how many consultants, how many, there, there are unknown number of consultants uh, have told the clients, uh, for in, in this case, for somebody like, for example, a, sp a spouse was in Canada and their, their partner was overseas and the spouse, uh, due to something, they were denied, you know, misrep. And now, now the other person saying, sorry, I'm doomed. Uh, I cannot come because my other partner has been charged for misrep. And the consultants, many consultants have told them, sorry, you're done. Both of you are done. The entire family is done. Five years, that's it. And they don't understand the section 4212, which, uh, which of course we have uh, pointed out right there. Uh, it's only on section 34, 35, 37. Section 40 does not constitute inadmissibility for the spouse, for the rest of the dependent family. So, so they, you know, they, one they, of the problems... They, they've discovered with the whole consultant's regime, and that's why they're changing it, is even today, a person can uh, take the course to become a consultant in as little as 16 weeks. Um, <laughs> I know. It, you know, it's ridiculous. You can't learn much in 16 weeks. And, and then what happens is so often, they open their own practice, so they're not being supervised, <laughs> they're not being trained by somebody who really knows what they're doing. Yeah. They're just let loose on the general public, and, and it's, it's appalling that, you know, to be a lawyer, you have to go for, to, to school for a minimum of seven years and then article for a year. Um, and that's going to weed out the unethical ones most of the time, not all the time, but it will. And, 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 and you know, when you article, you're, you're under somebody's supervision. So, you know, there's a better chance to get some higher level of competence. So that's one of the things, you, even if a person has a license, doesn't make them great. Now, there are some great consultants out there who know what they're talking about. Most of them stick to areas of specialty within the immigration. They don't try to do everything. They don't try to do refugee hearings and study permits, for instance. But um, it's all about, you know, uh, making sure you, you're dealing with somebody who is reputable. Now, I want to take you back to that uh, section 41B I will again. Bring it, bring it um, I will bring it up. I want to give you an example of how, how often this can happen yes. and how it can be. Uh, you're talking about making dependents inadmissible uh, in the sponsored situation. So here's how I see it play out normally. You see an arranged marriage uh, that is done really for immigration purposes. Yeah. Uh, so the person comes to Canada, they never live with their, their sponsor. They, they, and they apply for divorce as soon as they can. And quite often when they apply for divorce, the divorce lawyer doesn't know anything about immigration law. They ask for the date of separation. They give a date before they even came to Canada, yeah. right? So they, so basically saying when, when I came in and landed at the office and pretended I was still in a relationship when I landed, sorry, at the port of entry, I in fact was separated already. Uh, and so then they turn around later, once they get the divorce, they, they do another arranged marriage. And this time it's for real. It's the person they really want to be married with. Mm. Um, and they sponsor mm. that person. That person comes to Canada. Um, and uh, they're either, you know, this either gets detected during the course of the sponsorship or may get detected later on. Immigration finds those divorce papers 
And it's proof right there that the person misrepresented. So yeah. what happens that not yeah. only is that person now inadmissible, but the person, the second wife that they sponsored, she's inadmissible. And she can lose her status and be deported from Canada just because her status is based on somebody uh, who got their status by fraud. And that's how that section works. Um, you know, unfortunately, to, it, that's, it's not the one on the screen, but it's the one that was up there earlier um, about making dependents inadmissible um, just, just through the finding that the, 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 the first, the sponsor is inadmissible. Sure. So it just depends on, on the nature of the inadmissibility. It doesn't affect if the, if the sponsor, for instance, um, gets inadmissible for some other reason after the fact, but, but if, uh, if they got their status in Canada, look out. It's a, uh, it's a problem if they got it by misrepresentation. A lot of, lot of people, a who, lot of people who might be watching this in the future would wonder that if they were uh, deemed uh, uh, inadmissible under section 40 uh, and maybe last six months or last year, uh, I understand there's a statute of limitation of 60 days for them to file a judicial review. Yeah, it depends where they were found in a, uh, to be inadmissible. If it's an overseas office, then it's 60 days. Uh, if it's an in Canada decision, you have 15 days, that's it, 15 days to challenge in federal court. It's a very short period of time. So if you ever uh, get one of those procedural fairness letters, I say run to a good lawyer, not just any lawyer. And, and I wouldn't use a consultant for this because you're setting yourself up for federal court. So I want, you know, I want, if I'm going to be arguing the case in federal court, I will want their procedural fairness response to have been prepared with federal court in mind. So, so that in, in other words, that it's such a strong uh, response that it's very hard for the visa officer to ignore it. Um, but if you, do get, if you then get a, a refusal, then I'm saying, again, you've got to go get legal advice really fast. And sometimes a representative, I've seen both consultants and lawyers make this mistake, is they'll say, oh no, we'll just write and ask for reconsideration. I know, I the know. They, they, yeah, they think reconsideration is just a simple request, just like filing for a driver license to get it in the, within a few days. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, the, uh, I don't know if you want this on the screen anymore or if you want to go back to us, but yes. um, the, um, the, the thing that happens in a lot of these cases is people lose their chance to go to federal court because their, their time period for challenging federal court expires while they're waiting for a response to the reconsideration request. I know. And it's, uh, it's, it's all too common to happen is that, especially, and this isn't just in misrepresentation cases, it's in all kinds of immigration cases where there's a refusal and uh, the representative thinks that there's been a clear mistake made. So they think, well, I'll just ask them to look at it again and, and I'm sure they'll, they'll fix it. And instead of fixing it, you get, they get a letter back saying, we're not changing our minds. So too bad, so sad for you, go away. And they missed the chance to go to federal court. So that's why you, you know, you, anytime you get a, a threat of a refusal or an actual refusal, you got to run to somebody who is very good at this kind of case. Uh, Michael, I'll put your information down at the bottom of this uh, video so that people who are watching this or they know somebody who's in the same distress, they can uh, contact you independently and uh, so to get sound legal advice. One last question before I let you go. Uh, I know you said about uh, the time period for overseas applicants who are facing uh, refusal is 60 days. Have you, have you seen any exceptions to the 60 days? Maybe some kind of Unusual, unusual delay, unusual factor that could have uh, allowed for a successful leave of application to the federal court for a 60 days waiver? So there is, uh, there is a provision where you can ask the federal court to extend the time period, but it's, it's absolutely an exceptional circumstance. It's got to be, you know, an, an example would be where you actually hired, let's say you hired a lawyer to do it and they made a mistake and missed the filing deadline. They misunderstood the, de the deadline or something, or somebody in the office made a mistake or the, or the photocopier died or something, or the career <laughs> screwed up or things, things like that do happen. And I've seen them granted before. And, and quite often, you know, in a situation like that, I, I would be going to the Department of Justice and asking them to consent. Um, but if it's just because they got bad advice, it's, it's a harder one to do. 
um, we did one where um, I think we were we missed the the deadline to file uh, by the client did we weren't the lawyer at the time but but uh, by many months because the uh, they were using an unauthorized representative who was a, a former lawyer and consultant who had been disbarred he'd even been to jail before but they didn't know he was he was not authorized he he pretended that he was actually referred uh, to the case was referred to him by a, a licensed lawyer in Calgary. Um, anyway, uh, he hadn't communicated with them the, 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 I think it was the refusal decision, they haven't, hadn't seen it on time. And to, so they couldn't respond. Yeah. And so yeah. when the, by the time they finally saw it, it was way past the deadline. It was something like that. But you know, the, the court was understanding and agreed to, to allow him to uh, reopen. I had another where my client uh, had a refusal uh, at the port of entry, which is would be a 15-day deadline uh, to challenge it. Um, that one was actually Immigration Appeal Division, but they have a 30-day yeah they have a 30-day deadline. Yes, um, and yes. but he was a he was a paranoid schizophrenic who was unmedicated at the time, and he had no grasp on reality. And so we asked in that case for the uh, uh, extended time to file the application. They have a similar test to the federal court. And um, uh, the the uh, CBSA officer consented to uh, agreed, and it was up to the judge or the board member who also agreed to let us file late. It was about six months after the fact, uh, wow. because by that time he had treatment and he was now mentally competent. So there are excuses, but um, you're, you're you know just I didn't get around to it, or my consultant said let's just try reconsideration. That that's not a good excuse. Yeah. So act fast. The lesson is act fast. No problem. Uh, hey, thanks, uh, Mike, uh, for your time and for for people who are watching this. You know, go and check out this case. I uh, put put up the name on the screen. Uh, Araz Muhammad Mamdo Al Prifkani, if I can pronounce his name correct. So the docket number, everything is just copy and paste on Google, and you can see this, uh, read this case, and the magic words that you want to see at the end of the screen. Where is that? That last screen is. Michael Green, his name right there, Sherrod Green in Calgary. And let me show you the, the words uh, that we want to see. The application for JR is granted, no question of certification and no cost. So this is what you want to see in your case. Michael Green is the lawyer. If you have any misrep case, something to do in your background, maybe a PFL something, um, you need to call Mr. Green and I will put his name and address at the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much, Mike. and. Uh, Hope to see you someday. If you are in Edmonton, please drop by. Or if I'm in Calgary, I will. All right. Thank you so much. I, uh, thank you for the good work you do getting the, getting the message out and getting people educated. Sure. Thank you. Take care. All right. Take care. We'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.